Hello and welcome to the program. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for being with us. We are tackling cost of governance, particularly the emoluments of the legislative arm of government today, as well as the politics of the presidency in 2023, and which geopolitical zone should be given the nod, amongst others. My guest is the minority leader of the Ninth Senate of the Federal Republic, Senator Einaya Abari. Distinguished Senator Abari thank you for your time. Welcome to Newsnight. Yes, Ladi. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Are we making progress in this, in our democratic traditions, in the institutions, uh, in the conventions and so on? Uh, many people will say this is the longest that we have had uninterrupted uh, uh, civilian rule um, and that it would be reasonable to expect that the institutions are getting stronger, the conventions are getting stronger, people are getting more used to hearing contending voices and arguments and so on, which is supposed to be part of democracy. Are we on that path? Uh, unfortunately, what we're having is an anomaly. Usually, like you said, a long period of doing the same thing will have put certain things, set it, and you don't need to f go fight those battles again. But if you check today, the battles that were fought under the military, we are refighting them today. That is freedom of expression, making sure that everybody is not put inside one um, bracket, so to say. And uh, the question of making sure that you can't even speak your mind. That is what we are battling with today. So. In, with regard to that, there's no way we can say that we are making progress. On the contrary, we are actually going backwards. And I really feel very bad. Look, when democracy started in 99, if you recollect, between 99 and 2003, there was so much battle between the executive and the legislature because everybody was feeling the way and people hadn't been, you know, for a long time. And so you could excuse it, whatever was happening at that time. But after all this long time, we come today and people are not even let to exercise there. And then we have us in the, um, Legislative and being tagged as uh, you know a compliant, the the uh, judiciary more or less trampled under the heel of um, those in the executive, and um, if you look at the totality of everything, I can't say that we are actually making progress. Uh, you you alluded to this perception about. Uh, the executive arm being much stronger than the, or appearing to be stronger than the legislative and judicial arms. But if you take the 20 year period uh, as the focus, there, as you pointed out, at the beginning there were a lot of battles, but it was not just at the beginning. In fact, as we have gone on, there have been battles. Uh, the judiciary has had to adjudicate on virtually every level of the democratic process. Uh, uh, the legislature has had to fight uh, to establish its independence, if that is the phrase, uh, to establish its functions vis-a-vis -vis the other arms of government. Uh, and then those other arms have had to fight the legislature uh, in terms of uh, where its powers end and where theirs begin and all of that. I, I raise this because at this juncture, it would appear that that battle doesn't have an end. <laughs> and that worries quite a number of people because they say, while that battle is ongoing, the real business of those arms of government either gets neglected or is not performed to the satisfaction of those that you're supposed to serve. 
Yeah, it, it's, it has, um, I, I will not say it is because of the setup, but it has its roots partly in the way we are organized as a union, partly in the way that we have the constitution and the way it is set out. There is perennially a, I will say, a dissonance. That dissonance comes from the fact that we run a unitary system, yet we call ourselves a federal system. And so there, that, that tension is there because the aspect of federalism, which will underpin everything we are doing, is not observed. It's observed in the breach. And we have a constitution that imposes some type of unitarism on the whole polity. And therefore, that tension will always be there. And that is why it seems that it's unending. Um, there are 64 items in the exclusive legislative list. Ordinarily, if you're running a federal system, it shouldn't be more than 20 something. You're talking about defense, sustainable affairs, all those type of things. But we, we have a situation in which you know, the president can unilaterally spend monies that belong to the three arms of government. You have a system in which an arm of government cannot on its own take care of its security. It, he has to, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, the legislature has to depend on the executive for functions with regard to security. And so that's how we got to the very funny situation that happened in the last Senate, in which the Inspector General of Police refused to uh, answer a summons by the Senate. Usually, if you don't answer the summons of a Senate, we normally write, uh, we get the Senate President to write a summons and ask the Inspector General of Police to effect your uh, arrest and bring you to the chamber. Now you have the matter that it, it had to be this particular police himself. So we didn't have any way of getting him to come there. So at all times, you have all this type of, um, you know, I would say disconcerting elements within our system that we need to sit down and trash in order to have a smooth uh, republic. And that is why you find people insisting on the word restructuring. Part of what it means is also to be able to have a definition of roles within a federal system. Also to be able to reduce some of these, um, I mean, uh, stamp duties, all those type of things, sports, or, you know, matters that you would say you don't know whether it belongs to uh, a state government or it belongs to the federal government. For, for example, I read in the papers uh, of an incipient problem going to come between the Lagos state government and the federal government with regard to internal waterways. How can the federal government control the rivers <laughs> and <laughs> this thing within a state. But that's, but from what I've heard, that's what the water resources bill or, 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 or is supposed to that, That's what I'm saying. Ordinarily, it shouldn't. But then you go to the um, exclusive legislative list. There's somewhere there it, it says that you're in charge of the uh, 
what do you call it, the shores and all that. Now, what is the definition of a shore? You define the shore when it's it coming from the ocean. For those who will think in a federal manner, but for those who will think in a unitary manner, they will turn around and say that even the shores of rivers within your state is a federal uh, concern. It should not be. So you could see where our constitution has led us into something that we ought to sit down and properly trash out. Now, you, you mentioned restructuring. Uh, it's a name. But it's what, not a name. It's a name because what it <laughs> seeks to achieve, what it seeks to achieve, you've just explained. Yes. And I say it's a name because something that looked like that on the uh, bill called the Devolution of Powers bill mm -hmm. was uh, brought up in the, in the last Senate, mm -hmm. actually in the last National Assembly. Yeah, it is. I was there. And, uh, but it was defeated. Let me tell you why. Within the country, Nigeria, like I told you, that there is a conflict between federalism and unitarism. There are some people who think that this is a unitary state, and therefore, whatever they say is what should happen. And so when you bring up matter like devolution of power so that you will give impetus to the federal system we are running. They will say no. And I will just give you a small example so that you can reflect. I, I had uh, a discussion with a former governor from the North after that thing was defeated. And I asked him, why? He's also in your interest. He's a former governor in the Senate. He's also in the Senate today. And he told me, that without the federal allocation, that his state cannot even do anything, that they can't pay anything, they cannot do this. And so that they depend solely on the allocations that are done monthly. And therefore, anything that we bring up to say, as a federal system, you should be able to stay on your own to be able to generate your revenue, be able to do your stuff. Then they will say, no, 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 because they think they cannot survive. So I had to sit with him and said, okay, let us ask ourselves the question. What are the basic things that a man needs, or a woman needs, or a child needs in life? What? First one, apart from breathing your air and all that, is that you must have food. That not so. Then you must have shelter before you have medical and all that. And therefore, you have great arable land. And your state is bigger than Netherlands. But Netherlands sup uh, supplies 14% of all the agricultural needs of the whole world. That if you really manage yourself properly, you will be the food basket of Africa, not just Nigeria. And you won't have any need for what is called federal allocation. So that what I think that is going on is that this is the 21st century, and nobody willing to think. Everybody just wants to sit down and live a good life without work. And that's the only thing that is holding us down. Of course, he got angry when I told him, you want to sit down and not. I said, no, we walk, we do that. I said, no, you're not channeling your resources properly. You're just sitting down and getting allocations and then you're paying salaries and all that. That is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to invest and change the structure of your own local economy. There's no way they can do that. Why? Because they have two, two things that are holding down everybody around there. Religion, which they use to oppress other people. And education, which we have refused to let everybody 
forget that once you do those things and free people, then they will see the enormous potentials that are there. And that's why you find that an Indian will show up here today and he becomes multi-rich. A Lebanese will show up here today. He will become, why? Because he's seeing the opportunities that we refuse to see. Because all that it takes is education. That's why part of what we continue to insist is that you must give your priorities to those areas that will make somebody who is now in the 21st century understand what he's supposed to do. Now, you're, you're one of the principal officers of the National Assembly, of the Senate, but, and by extension, the National Assembly. And therefore, when you sit and say things like this, people who are <coughs> um, listening to you or watching you will ask the question, but the perception is that uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives already corner a large chunk of these resources that you say are currently being misapplied and need to be reallocated uh, by way of uh, emoluments of various <laughs> types. I mean, the trending thing at the moment <laughs> is the 5.5 billion that is said to have been made provision for to buy vehicles for uh, the National Assembly. And people are saying, if you all recognize that we have a crisis, that we have a problem, and that we are economically in trouble, if indeed we are, how is this a priority expenditure? So let me put it this way. I used to be the spokesman of the Senate, and I've had this interaction so many times then, and that is, we have a national budget, total national budget. And out of the total national budget, the budget for the National Assembly, which everybody, senators, House of Rep members, staff, National Assembly, Service Commission, Code of Conduct, all those ones, 2%. 2%. Of the total federal budget. Of the total federal budget. And so I asked them, assuming you remove 2%. What will be the impact? Assuming we don't have a National Assembly, to be infinitesimal. And so nobody looking at the 98% and asking a question, where are you spending this 98%? And you know, what, what really we see is that, instead of being critical, uh, in our thinking, which is what I continue to reiterate, what we do is to do, um, we put on blinkers and all that. What does a National Assembly member earn? What? The National Assembly member earns what the revenue mobilization says it should earn, which is at the same par with ministers and all that and governors about two million or so. By the time you add every other thing, I will go home with about 700 and something um, thousand a month. Yet, I have an office, the office of the senator for Abia South. Just like you have an office, the office of the minister of Niger Delta, or the office of the minister of education. That is my office. And so, each office has an overhead. Now the overhead that is in the office of the Minister of Education, nobody attributes that overhead to the minister. But you can't expect the minister earning 600 or so thousand, or the governor earning 650,000 to spend going to Lagos for, let's say he's invited to deliver a speech or he's attending a meeting or all that. You're not expecting, expecting him to spend that 650,000 from that money. 
We don't. Because the office of a governor has an overhead to say this is for travel, this is for this, this is for that. Is that not so? So why is it that the National Assembly is different? That my overhead for health, you are not saying it's my salary. So you could see where the mistake is. And I can tell you, and the press knows that, that I called them when I was minister, uh, the uh, senior spokesman. And I said, let's sit down and let's analyze everything. And I said, okay, so find, find any country in the world. Give me their emoluments and their overhead. I said, okay, fool. so we could go to the United States um, Congress. Google it, bring it out, let's look at it here. And we saw it. For every senator in the United States, your salary is simple. $174,000, but your overhead for your office depends on the size of your constituency. So from the smallest constituency, which is Maine also, to the largest constituency, which is California, it ranges from $3.6 million to $4.6 million. In fact, we specifically at that time checked the one for Obama when he was senator. His overhead was $4.2 million. So and I asked all the pressmen who were with me, why are you not publishing this? I earned 754000 or so. So every week, I have to go back home. At least a fortnight, I must reach my constituency. I must meet with them. I must do this. So, and I fly, because going by road is a difficulty, as you know. Now, if I use my whole salary, I probably will go only, I won't even go at all, because I have to feed now. I have to do <laughs> all those things. So you could see that there has been a flight away from facts, and all of us are dealing in fiction, we are looking at ways to make governance not so expensive. We're looking at ways to make governance less costly to the Nigerian public so that what comes out of it should be to the welfare of the public. But what we see, and I have a paper that I had done for the University of Benin alumni. There was a time that I'd give a lecture there. And that lecture I titled it, How the Budget Underdevelops Nigeria. And there are some things that are inbuilt in the budget of Nigeria. One of those things is this question of, OK, every budget, uh, every um, administration, if they get up to 20 to 30% of the, uh, between uh, capital and recurrent, they'll be clapping for themselves. Ordinarily, as a developing country, it should be the other way around. Our recurrent should be around 30%, and our capital budget should be about 70 So that what you're doing is investing and reinvesting and growing your economy. But what we see is the reverse. So the issue really is, how do you deal with this humongous amount of recurrent budget? Yeah, but uh, it's funny when you say that, because a lot of people ask the same question. And um, they say, they, I mean, it's pointed out that the humongous recurrent uh, budget has to do with the number of people 
employed by government in various ministries, departments, and agencies at various levels. Uh, and that um, a lot of this has accumulated over the period, uh, even before democracy returned. And that, secondly, wages have had to move. Uh, there's one ongoing currently, the mm -hmm. 30,000 minimum wage, which will also have implications on what is already, as you described it, a big recurrent expenditure. And then all these other things that are attached to the presidential system of government, uh, which you called overheads, all amount to quite a bit. But I guess you mentioned the University of Benin alumni, so that then reminded me that you read economics at the University of, course. of Benin. Uh, yes. at the BSc and at the master's level. Yeah. Um, where we are now, can we sustain it? It's, it's, it's not sustainable. That is why we need to restructure this country. We can't sustain it under the unitary system that we run. And I will tell you why I say so. Cost of living in Abuja is higher than cost of living in let's say Kaura Namoda, in our home, we say no being a local government. The salaries you, um, the rent you pay, your cost of living may be slightly lower. So why would you insist that the state will not do a level of um, what they can? you know, comfortably carry. You insist that the person who lives in Lagos, you must live at the same level with him. And so that is part of the reason why we are saying that if you're trying to change the system, and you know, there's this myth that, oh, if we go back to the parliamentary system, it's cheaper and all that, it's not true. Why was the parliamentary system overthrown too? if it was that good. Innately, we have two things that are bothering or that are a problem for us as a country. And that is, one is that people don't pay for their crimes. And so when you do a big crime and because you have, you have attained a certain height, you don't get penalized. And once you don't get penalized, then that becomes a norm. Let me put it that way. Recently, we got, um, you know, through our mails, uh, some memo that was done by NFIU. And everybody was saying, ah, how could this happen? So NFIU wants to see let the banks get the bank accounts of everybody in the National Assembly and everybody in the judiciary. They left the bank accounts of those in the executive. They didn't ask for that. Yet, who are the people who are the most richest people in Nigeria? It's not the politician. It's all the people who are there in the federal executive, uh, this thing. Uh, the directors, uh, PAMSEX, everybody, and it's been proved. And so you will now see that if crime is not punished, then that bad behavior is reinforced and sustained, and the country pays a price for it. Two, if we don't get to grips with the difficult situation we are today, we, cannot, we can just continue bleeding until we bleed out. There has been no um, agency that has been set up by government to alleviate the sufferings of our people, that has ended up well. Why? Why? 
Why? <laughs> the question I, I ask, I, I say the same thing all over again. Because our system treats people unequally. You come from a certain part of this country, you commit a crime, you are not punished for it. You are in a certain, um, you know, milieu, and another person in a certain milieu, and somebody, a crime is committed, and nobody does anything about it. What do you expect will be happening? People will always turn to self-help when they see that. Well, nothing happens to those who have done it before. If you now catch somebody, you say, ah, what about this other person? He did the same thing, yet, you know, and we have seen cases and cases of this happening. Beyond everything you've said so far, if there isn't security, none of these things that we've discussed so far can even be tabled for discussion. Now, in various parts of the country, different things, uh, banditry, kidnapping, herdsmen and farmers, uh, amongst others. The governors have taken on a number of measures to tackle some of the most obvious challenges. Uh, rangers, clearing of roads, cooperation across party lines, and so on. But on a national level, and even in the southeast, the insecurity continues. What are we going to do about it? Yeah, but I've told you. No, go, you haven't. Go, no, no, go back to what I said at the beginning uh, as part of our conversation. And I said, we run a unitary system in a federal environment, well, a so-called federal government. That is what is holding everybody. A state governor can only call the director of SS in his state and only call the, uh, maybe if there's a battalion in his state, he will probably call him and call the police commissioner and say, please, let's have a security meeting. And then they will say, oh, what do we do? When he finishes, each of these people will go back to their own lines of authority. Governor cannot give them an instruction if it is not approved by their own line of authority. If he had operational command of the police within his, um, let's say, his territory, he can now say, oh, okay, so we got this problem around here. Now, all of you who are the uh, soldiers, police, this and that, encircle the place, close it up. I bring helicopters, I pay for this, I make sure that we get everybody. But he doesn't have that capacity so he will call these people and tell them, and they will say, okay, we'll get back to you. One week, two weeks, three weeks, nothing is happening. Why? Because they're still waiting for this chain of command to give them this thing. So that is what you see when you have. And you see, what is going on today is that we are still living in the 19th century, in terms of our thoughts with regard to security and all that, when we are actually in the 21st century and the people who you're dealing with are moving beyond and ahead of you. IPO, yeah. the indigenous peoples of Biafra, uh, have made it into some kind of policy that they intend to attack as a first step. No, no, they don't intend to attack. They already did one. <laughs> they already did one. 
Um, Senator, they did one already. <laughs> oh, well, oh, well, is that they what you mean? No, what they said is that... No, what, where I'm going is this. Yeah, no, where okay. I'm going is this. Let me get they, where you're going. Yes, they, they said that even though they did the first before they now announced it as a policy, maybe in order to keep the element of surprise, they attacked Deputy Senate President, your colleague, in yeah. Cape Madu, uh, in Nuremberg, in Germany. And then after that, they then said they were going to attack all, publicly humiliate all, southeastern leaders. And then, of course, Nigerian leaders. They threatened to go after the president during his visit in, to Japan uh, for ticket seven. But, the, but those who have been watching this yes. point out a certain irony. The leadership of IPOP the leader of IPO is said to owe his freedom today to you, Senator Ekwerimadu, and a couple of others like that. So what went wrong that they now think you are part of the problem? I don't think that that is the best way to look at it. We start from the basis. What have been their grouse? Their grouse is what I had said earlier, which is we see a situation where in the same country there are bifurcated treatments for the same citizens. And so, if you're from the southeast, first, you're denied access to national resources. Secondly, the southeast is a zone that is under siege by all the security formations in this country. Well, the reason they give is that the solution that IPOB has tried to implement no, no, I, was to I, secede. I, I no, I'm coming. The siege was there before IPOB. From, so? from, from any time that you can go back from the end of the Civil War till today, if you go from the town of Onecha to Were, and go from the town of Owere to Aba, you will get not less than 140 police checkpoints. Every one kilometer, there's a police checkpoint. What do they do? They're not, they're not checking for security. They are simply extorting money from commuters on the road, from bus drivers, KK drivers, almost. They, they, it's people pay to be posted to the southeast. And you leave the southeast, and you're driving all the way to the rest of the country. You don't see the same type of intense policing, let's put it that way. So what the question you will ask yourself is, why are we different? Or why are we treated differently? That happened a long time before the equation of IPOP came. They didn't bring people because of IPOP. It is the fact that all these things and all these things had happened, that there was a deliberate policy to cripple all the ports in the Southeast region, Portacot, Calabar, Wari, all those ones, none of them is working. You will have to take everything to Lagos. And so you're, you're an importer in Onecha. You must go to Lagos. The shortest one to you is Wari, actually, before even Portacot, Orne, all those ones. Why? You can't have a, a ship pass through there. Why? No dredging. Why is there no dredging? Federal government policy, no contract for it. So you ask yourself, if this is like this way, then that means that there is a deliberate policy to keep us down or something. And so, what is the reaction? Two ways. You appeal or you fight. And so, you have two sets of people in the Southeast now, those who want to. Let's continue talking. Let's see how we can resolve this issue. And then those who say, no, 
We're already down and out. What else does it take? Let us all die. And, you know, the federal government just turns a blind eye. And I continue to say, and I have sat on the floor of the Senate and I've said it. Why has this federal government not ever opened their mouth to say that the Hatsmen are terrorists? Why? Why would this federal government not ever agree that all these people who are carrying AK-47s are killing people are terrorists? Yet, it was so easy to quickly go to court to get an injunction and declare IPOB terrorists. That means that in the mindset of those who are running this country today, they see some people as their enemies. They have not come out of the civil war. 50-something years later, they are still fighting the civil war. And so what they do today is that they come and call us. I'm a politician. I'm one of those who are seen as, and say, oh, don't worry. If you just be with us, we will make you president. And they think they are talking to fools. And they tell us, oh, don't worry. This is time for Igbo president. No Igbo man wants a president. What we want is that you restructure this country so that me and you, Ladi, we are seen as citizens. So that if I carry an AK-47, you jail me. It's not if I carry a flag, you jail me, and then I carry an AK-47, you say, leave him, he's our brother coming from Burkina Faso. How can that be? But you haven't, you haven't touched on what I said. And what is that? About IPO. I have talked and on IPO, and I've, I've told you the why underpilling. Do they think, no, and why the, do they think that you are now part of the problem? <laughs> the reason or, really, or uh, they, they, the reason really is that they, 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 look at, they look at me, they look at Equerimado, they look at all of us, and they say, but you people are sitting down there. Because there are also young people who believe that you should do the fight, and not that there are other ways of engaging in this. We are not as young as they are. <laughs> we have, uh, most of us have crossed 60, and so we believe that you should talk quite all right. So you could understand their frustration. Because what they will feel is that, I mean, you have talked for too long at every point, you know, and they will tell them, no, understand it. Four years is not an eternity. So we will have to continue to do these uh, engagements, let me put it that way. But from, the, from what you said, uh. the political calculus, I've spoken to quite a number of people, and... Um, the political calculus is set to now favor the Southeast. It's not true. Not true. It's nothing but... If, if, um, if as the political alignments are, yes. and they have been since 1999, yes. the South-South, the Southwest, have each had a president. Yes. The Northwest... Yes. Had a president. Uh, and now, if you take it beyond the geopolitical zones and you talk of simply north and south, it started in the south, it's gone to the north, it's come back to the south, it's gone to the north, and by 2023, it's supposed to come back to the south. In this chair you are sitting, Chief Edwin Clark, Chief John Wodo, have all said that in the case of Chief Clark, he was clear that there's no contesting it. Morality, justice, and even politics dictate that it is the throne of the Southeast. So when you say, as the most senior ranking Southeasterner in the government structure today, that that's not true, many people will be taken aback. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll have a very simple answer to that. If somebody cannot let you be his gate man, how is he going to give you the keys to his house 
to come and live in the house. And I've just pointed out to you, show me that one person in this present government of APC, apart from statutory people who is in this government. Show me one. Statutory ministers. Of course, you must have ministers. That is what the Constitution the, uh, the, Tell me which other person. They have SGF, they have this, they have E, they have A, they have all those ones. They never let any person from the Southeast get near. And then they will tell the Southeast, oh, this and that, that they will get there. How are you going to get there? And I continue to reiterate the, and I ask everybody in APC, if you don't let me be your gate man, how can you give me the key to your house? Because if you want me to be president, that means you're going to bring me in. I'm going to be part of what you do. I'm going to have a role in your government. So if you're a minister, you don't see the president except you go through the chief of staff. Is that not what, is, what we are told? Or you write your memo and it goes through the secretary to government. So where do you get in? Where? Yet we have top people. We had former Senate presidents and all that who are part of the APC, yet they are nowhere to be found. And so if somebody by his demiano, by his action, does not let you even smell the seat of government. And then the man tells you, don't worry, in four years' time I'm going to give it to you. How will you believe him? That means you're not thinking. So, and that's why I'm saying that those of us who have seen all this, we are saying it really doesn't matter what you tell me. Because what you tell me is not what is happening. We want that. We do devolution of powers. We change the revenue formula. We make sure that part of the revenue formula is uh, the criteria is changed so that you can move things away. That population plays a part and no longer landmass and all that. Those are the things that we need to do for us to know that we are having a viable union. So it's all right, mate. <laughs> Thank you My so pleasure. Much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's News Night today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.